A new study sheds light on what taxpayers think about ransomware attacks on their local governments. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Wendy Whitmore, Vice President of IBM X-Force. Welcome back, Wendy. Thanks, Tanya. It's great to be back. So as a refresher, what is the mission of IBM's X-Force? Uh, so the X-Force team is comprised of threat intelligence analysts and researchers, also of incident responders who are consultants that go out and respond to some of the major breaches in the world, and then also our cyber range facilities, which look to bring real life experiences to our clients so that we can train them and how to be more effective at responding to breaches. So I think it's fair to say that we're pretty passionate about breach response and making our clients be much more effective at responding and detecting incidents. So IBM Security recently released a study exploring the point of view of taxpayers in regards to local governments and ransomware attacks. So based on the study results, how many Americans are familiar with ransomware? You know, it's pretty significant. So we were surprised because nearly 80% of the respondents um, to the ransomware study let us know that they were actually very concerned, right, about ransoms. We've seen, uh, you know, I, th I think that's due to a number of factors, right, but we've seen them in the news um, in particular in terms of how they're impacting cities, right? There have been over 70 ransomware attacks targeted towards cities just in 2019 alone. And, you know, ransoms ranging from the tens of thousands of dollars to just in the last couple of weeks, upwards of $5 million. So this is definitely getting taxpayer attention. And again, 80% of, of us are concerned about what's actually going on with ransoms in particular. So tell us quickly, what a ransomware attack on local government looks like? What actually happens? So, you know, a ransomware attack in general is when um, a piece of data or maybe a lot of pieces of data, for example, get stolen from an environment. And when, by stolen, we mean they're encrypted and removed from the environment. And so ultimately, the organization, or in this case, the city, no longer has access to this data. Now, that becomes a big problem if that's really critical data, right? Like access to 911 systems or a city's payroll or ability to um, conduct tax payments right? Those type of things have a very serious impact. And so what happens is once the data is encrypted and removed from the environment, then ultimately the ransomware, uh, the attacker will say, hey, you know, we've, we've got this data. Um, we'll only decrypt it for you if you pay us this amount of dollars. And ultimately, these organizations are faced with, well, you know, do we look at, um, you know, do we weigh paying a ransom or do we weigh, um, you know, having access to the data? So in the cases that you're not hearing about that are very successful, which there are a number of those, you know, the organizations have access to the data already. It's backed up somewhere else. They can restore it. And ultimately, they don't have to even um, go through any of these questions of, you know, weighing the pros and cons of what, we, what they do. Um, one common misconception, though, that we hear over and over again, um, and this study really, I think, kind of highlights it as well, is people think it's as simple as, well, do I pay the ransom or not? You know, how do I weigh these pros and cons? The reality is it's not either or. It, if you pay the ransom, you're still going to have to take the necessary steps to fix the environment so that that type of attack isn't successful again. And then when you do actually get, you know, the ability to decrypt, like the decryption keys, you have to have someone go in manually decrypt each of the files or each of the systems, depending on how they're compressed. And ultimately, that takes significant time and some technical resources as well. It's, it's crazy to think that paying a ransom is something that you should actually do, but ZDNet's, uh, ZDNet's Larry Dignan reported that Jackson City, Georgia, and Lake City and River City, Florida, saw paying ransom as a viable option. And based on the study results, what did you learn about taxpayers' opinions on how governments should respond to ransomware attacks? It's really interesting. So over 60% uh, didn't believe that their their cities or their local governments should be paying ransom. So I think we can certainly say that the majority of people um, get the idea that it's not a good idea to pay ransom and that they're not interested in their tax dollars going to support that. 
However, you know, that said, the other side of the coin is that they weren't, as, citizens weren't as excited about also paying for kind of the infrastructure, right? So having their taxes increase so that cities can become more resilient about this with these attacks. And so the problem that we face is that cities are a, a uniquely um, kind of target rich environment, if you will, for these types of attacks um, for a number of factors. Things like they're dispersed. So there's a lot of different departments within a city or a state or any kind of local government. So everything from a finance department to police to fire is all separate, right? And what that means is having the technical visibility into the, that environment becomes really challenging. Um, a lot of these environments have pretty outdated IT systems, so outdated computers and server infrastructure um, that, you know, may not have the latest patches. And that, again, it's hard to have that level of visibility into these systems so that they can identify specifically what type of attack has occurred and then how to effectively prevent it. Um, coupled with that is that, you know, we're talking about government budgets, right? So government budgets to pay employees as well. And in a job market that is as competitive as, as it is right now with as many um, job shortages of skilled people in this industry, it's very hard to attract really talented personnel and then retain them. Because once they have um, experience for six months to a year at a job like a city government, um, they're then able to take that skill set, which is very marketable and potentially take it somewhere else. So the reality is that this is still a bit of a, you know, funding problem for sure when we look at just IT security targeted towards cities in particular. And then the reality that, um, you know, I think one of the other survey findings that I found really fascinating was that taxpayers kind of overwhelmingly felt like the federal government should help out state and local and city governments in this and it was almost like um you know funding after a hurricane or some sort of natural disaster right we're going to declare a state of emergency and the federal government should come in and, and help out so i think that's a discussion that really brings up right a lot of interesting angles and points probably something that we'll be hearing a lot more about in the future is should we do that um you know should the federal government be providing more more resources and maybe even tax forces to supplement some of these local government organizations as well do taxpayers perceive the threats to their personal data or do they see the threats more directed towards government operations? Yes, yeah, great question. So overwhelmingly, the taxpayers were really interested in the threats to their personal data, right? There were um, much more of a concern about, you know, there's a likelihood that my personal data could be impacted, um, but less of a concern um, in the sense of I will pay extra taxes to make sure that my, you know, K through 12 education, um, school districts are, are provided for and protected, that the police departments and, and 911 lines are protected and paid for. So, um, you know, it's kind of this dichotomy. We know there's a problem. We're not exactly sure just how to fix it just yet. So besides maybe looking at the future and, and hoping that the federal government might step in with some additional help, based on your study, what are your recommendations to city leaders for preventing ransomware attacks? So I think this all comes down to preparation, right? And the reality is that organizations across the board are going to get attacked. So we can't stop the ability that um, they're the opportunity for an attack. But what we can do is make these organizations more prepared and more resilient so that they lower the impact of these attacks. So some common ways to do that. Um, one is training and, and preparation, right? So actually working through crisis scenarios with the team of people that would be involved in responding to a real life breach. Um, organizations that do that um, in, decrease their overall cost by almost 30%. So there's an actual marked financial impact on an investment of training scenario preparation. The next thing would be to really identify where is your most critical and sensitive data within your environment, and then figure out how we're going to make sure we have offline backups of that data, right? So um, we're not saying back up everything in your environment to, to make sure that it's offline because that's very costly, but identifying the most critical pieces, data sets, financial transactions, um, you know, education records, 911 information, that type of stuff should be available offline so that in the case that it does get 
um, encrypted by an attacker, you can actually restore it from the most recent backup versus having things kind of virtually wiped out. Um, and then from a perspective of, you know, working through things like multi-factor authentication, um, right, organizations that have that implemented for services that um, are open to the web, that's something that's pretty critical as well because attackers are looking to exploit any type of way in. Um, you know, oftentimes that can be through spear phishing emails, but 43% of the time it's actually through misconfigured servers that are available, um, you know, to the internet. So we need to really look at how we make sure that we can lock down some authentication to those devices as well. Wendy Whitmore, Vice President of IBM X-Force. Thanks again for joining us and uh, giving us some idea of what consumers are thinking about uh, and constituents are thinking about uh, security and ransom. If somebody wants to connect with you, Wendy, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Wendy Whitmore or also on LinkedIn at the same, same name and address. Sounds good. Thanks again, Wendy. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.